Constitution in response to the abuses by the king's soldiers and searching and sometimes ransacking the homes of colonists. In the more than 220 years since the amendment was adopted, the court has carved out a variety of exceptions to the warrant requirement, such as a protective pat-down search, vehicle searches because of their inherent nature to leave a scene, and others. Generally, however, the Supreme Court has held that searches of someone's home without a warrant were illegal. On May 16, 2011, the court opened the door wide for police to burst into a home without a warrant. Police in Lexington, Kentucky, were involved in a controlled purchase of crack cocaine. One officer watched the transaction take place. As the dealer left, the observing officer radioed. <clears throat> as the de- <clears throat> and as the dealer left, the observing officer radioed at others that the suspect was entering a nearby apartment building and they should hurry up to apprehend him. Officers in marked cars headed to the scene, but the suspect entered the building ahead of them, turned down a hallway, and entered an apartment. There were two apartments that the suspect could possibly have entered, one on the left, one on the right. The officers smelt marijuana emanating from the apartment on the left. As a result, the officers approached the door on the left, banged on the door as loud as they could, and announced themselves as police officers. The officers heard some shuffling around in the apartment, but no one answered the door. Those sounds led officers to believe that evidence was being destroyed, so they announced they were going to enter and proceed to break down the door. Inside, they found some cocaine, some marijuana, and drug paraphernalia. They did not find the dealer that had participated in the crack cocaine sale. They later learned the dealer was in the apartment on the right. The unlucky occupant of the apartment on the left, Hollis, Deshaun King, was arrested and eventually sentenced to 11 years in prison. The Kentucky Supreme Court found that the search of King's apartment was illegal, that officers should have found a judge and gotten a search warrant. The Kentucky Supreme Court overturned King's conviction. This is the historic role of the Fourth Amendment, especially when it comes to someone's home. The U.S. Supreme Court disagreed with the Kentucky Supreme Court. Justice Alito said, In light of the facts given to them, this was a situation that was an exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirements. The search of King's home was legal despite the fact that officers had no warrant and that his conviction should be reinstated. The Supreme Court relied on the exigent circumstances, exigent, I'm sorry, exigent circumstances, exception to the Fourth Amendment. So Justice Alito began the court opinion with, It is well established that exigent circumstances, including the need to prevent the destruction of evidence, permit police to conduct an otherwise permissible search without obtaining a warrant. Up until this decision, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Fourth Amendment had drawn a firm line at the entrance to a home. Warrantless entry had been allowed to a house for the eminently reasonable purposes of rendering emergency assistance to an injured occupant, to protect the well-being of an endangered occupant, or the hot pursuit of a fleeing felon. In some limited instances, protecting, uh, protection of evidence has been allowed, but generally more has been required than happened in this case. In, the case. in this case, the police knocked loudly. They announced they were police. No one answered the door, but the police heard movement inside the apartment. They smelled marijuana. They did not know if the dealer involved in the air investigation was in that apartment. But they broke down the door, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that this was a legal act. The decision decision was 8 to 1, with only Justice Ginsburg dissenting. Justice Ginsburg rightly observing, Two pillars of our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence should have controlled the court's ruling. First, whenever practical, the police must obtain advanced judicial approval of searches and seizures through the warrant procedure. And that was Terry v. Ohio in 1968. Second, unwarranted searches and seizures inside a home bear heightened scrutiny. Justice Ginsburg's observation took only four pages to affirm the principles of the Fourth Amendment that the Supreme Court majority swept away with this decision. If the police may break down Mr. King's door based upon a smell, a knock, and no answer, there is little to stop them from breaking down anyone's door 
based upon a smell, a knock, and no answer. Another bit of liberty was taken away from Americans with this decision. They probably went in on the cop-out of probable cause. Yep. Now, what effect does this have? You know, not much more than a week after the the Indiana debacle, the Indiana sheriff is talking about door-to-door searches. So, you know, this is this is just absolutely absurd, folks. Are we going to think? I mean, this is just nuts. Well, you know what that do you know what that does, Joe? That ref, that and, and I'm probably going to offend some people, but if that takes place, that just reaffirms my belief that Americans have no balls, <laughs> and we are screwed. No point blank. If the if the powers that be and the Nazi jackboot bastards are going to blatantly defy their oaths and the Constitution by doing illegal acts against the citizenry and the Constitution, and the American people don't respond in kind, mm-hmm. then they never will. Tis true, John. Tis true. Let's take a break. We'll be back in about three minutes. Stay tuned, folks. Welcome back, folks. That was a Marine Corps marching band. Gotta love it. Anyway, this is your host, Mark Schmuckatelli and Bob Schmuckatelli. Bob, are you there? (laughs) Bob Schmuckatelli, I'm looking for you. I'm here. Okay, good. (laughs) You had me on mute, didn't you, Mark? I sure did, my man. Okay, so we were talking about the Fourth Amendment and how it had died. Now, uh, Indiana, of course, uh, a week prior to the Kentucky decision, had already come to the conclusion that the hell with it, 
You know, police can just go ahead and knock on your door. And now we have sheriffs in the state of Indiana saying that house-to-house searches are now in order, which is just fabulous. But I heard an interesting argument, John, on on the radio the other day, uh, and that does the Bill of Rights apply to the states? And it's an interesting legal question because in the beginning and in the constitution at the constitution's inception it did not it had to do with a person's rights but pertaining to the federal government not to the states Let, uh, but then well then 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 the 14th amendment came around and a lot of people may not know the 14th amendment but anyway i want to go over this john and go over the 14th Amendment and, and maybe people can understand and then give some, some Supreme Court precedent as to which rights have been incorporated. You know, the debate over the whether the 14th Amendment makes applicable uh, against the states all the protections of the Bill of Rights is one of the most important and long-lasting debates involving interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. The Supreme Court's first interpretation of the scope of the 14th Amendment adopted in 1868 was rendered in the slaughterhouse cases just five years later. By a five to four vote, the court in that case narrowly interpreted the Privileges and Immunities Clause thought to be the most likely basis for enforcing individual rights against states. In in subsequent cases, attention focused on the Due Process Clause. Beginning in the early 20th century, the court began to selectively incorporate some of the specific provisions of the Bill of Rights while rejecting the incorporation of others. The court's test for choosing which provisions, along with all the accompanying baggage of decisions interpreting the federal rights, were incorporated changed over time. The modern view, as reflected in cases such as Duncan v. Louisiana in 1968, is that provisions of the Bill of Rights Fundamental to the American scheme of justice, such as the right to a jury trial, were made applicable to the states by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, whereas other provisions, such as the right to a jury trial in a civil case involving more than $20, were not made applicable. Note that there are several possible positions that could be taken with respect to the incorporation debate. First, one could argue that the 14th Amendment, either through the P&I Clause or the Due Process Clause, made the specific provisions of the Bill of Rights enforceable against the states and no more. This was the view uh, argued by Justice Black. Second, one could argue that the provisions of the Bill of Rights are essentially irrelevant to interpretation of the 14th Amendment and that violations of the Due Process Clause are to be determined by a natural law like tests such as, does the state's actions shock the conscience? Or is the state's actions inconsistent with our concept of ordered liberty? This is the no incorporation theory advanced by Justice Frankfurter, among others. And third, one could take a position, such as Justice White did in Duncan, that the 14th Amendment incorporates certain fundamental provisions, but not, but not other non-fundamental provisions. And that's the selective incorporation theory. But the most recent court decision on incorporation came in 2010, and I'm sure you've all heard of it, McDonald versus Chicago, involving a challenge to Chicago's tough gun control legislation. Just two years earlier, the court ruled in a case challenging a District of Columbia gun control regulation that the Second Amendment guaranteed an individual right to bear arms. And McDonald, by a 5-4 to four vote, The court held that the Second Amendment right was thought by ratifiers of the 14th Amendment among those fundamental rights necessary to our system of ordered liberty and is therefore now a right fully enforceable against the states. Judge Thomas, concurring, argued that the better vehicle for incorporation, one truer to the original understanding of the 14th Amendment, was the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Dissenters argued that the right to bear arms, unlike other forms of substantive liberty, often put other lives at risk. 
and was therefore not the sort of liberty the 14th Amendment protected against the state enforcement. <laughs> but 